begin the study in the book of Amos. Dear Lord, we thank and praise you once again for bringing us to your house. We are so grateful to you for keeping us safe in the land of the living. Lord, as we study thy word, we pray that you may help us to learn your heart and follow it. Dear Lord, as we study the word of God, help us never to forget the God of the word. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for bringing that dear children, those who are on the way, you bring them. And help us to study this word together. I pray thanksgiving in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We are in Amos chapter 8, and I think we'll finish uh, Amos 8 and 9. That will be the end of the book of Amos. Um, you know, every uh, book in the Old Testament, especially the prophets, have always ended the story with restoration. See, God is a God of giving second chances. When He created the world, the Bible says in the beginning He created, right? The heavens and the earth. But right away, the whole world was, you know, uh, it, lost its, is, it lost its purity. But what did God do in the last chapter, la first chapter, last verse? It says, he saw that everything was good. How did it happen? God took the broken stuff and started working on it. See, nobody wants, nobody likes, no, very few people understand the value of recycling. You know, a lot of people, when I was growing up, I had a friend whose dad was a scrap dealer. He used to think, you know, why, man, why do you want to do such nasty stuff? You know, go pick up all the trash. You know, the same trash you take and recycle, it becomes a beautiful product. So that's what God is doing with Israel every time. See, through multiple prophets, he's telling the same message. You destroyed your life, but you know what? I can work it out. You spoil your life, that's okay. You disobeyed me, you're under persecution, you're under trouble. Maybe I caused it, maybe I allowed it. But you know what? I'm giving you one more chance. So... In chapter 8, he's talking, so therefore, see the restoration does not happen without tough talk. Please remember that. Restoration with God doesn't have without a tough talk. It's always very rough. But if you don't want that roughness, if you don't want that toughness, you know, the sin cannot be dealt with. So the problem is, we don't want... Uh, we don't want to hear the bad news. We want to hear the healing, but without the surgery. But surgery is essential for that healing. What God is doing here with His people is, when they went wrong, especially the context in Amos is they are rich people. There are three national sins, that is eat, drink and be merry. They are exploiting the poor people. They are so abundantly rich, they have uh, summer houses and winter houses. They are selling poor people for a pair of sandals. And uh, they don't care for God. They are doing all the rituals. At the same time, they are also worldly. It's a mix. So when God saw this, they, God picked up an, a villager and uh, a guy who's not really qualified from our point of view to go and face the urban crowd, you see? See, to face the urban crowd, you need that etiquette. Amos doesn't have that etiquette. He's an ordinary man. He was a shepherd. But he has that boldness to go and confront the people and especially confront the rich people and tell them, you know what? You're messing with God. And he was a very daring prophet. So, God used this man, and at the same time, while well, he was tough, he's now talking about how restoration happens. There's going to be tough talk in chapter 8, and you hear about restoration in chapter 9. Let's see what is the tough talk in chapter 8. So, God started giving him visions, and of these visions, we come to the chap uh, uh, chapter 8, there's a vision of a basket. Verse 8, chapter 8, verse 1. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. A basket of ripe fruit. In uh, King James Version, it is called summer fruit. 
In NIV it is called ripe fruit, in King James it is called summer fruit. I'll explain what that means. What do you see, Amos? He asked. A basket of ripe fruit. I answered. Then the Lord said to me, The time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. There are two things in this one uh, important concept. It's a basket of ripe fruit. Right? Ripe fruit. So, the fruit comes when it has been harvested. This fruit is now ripe. You get it? There are two things. Number one, it is a fruit. But fruit could not be even ready. But this fruit is ready and it's been harvested. How do we know? It's in a basket. It's not on a tree. If the fruit was still on a tree, it could be like, you know, probably it is still going to ripen. No. It's ripe. Therefore, it's been plucked out. So it's been harvested. It's in a basket. There are two things. Number one. See, harvest always talks about judgment. Harvest always talks about judgment. I'll, I'll show you two verses. Uh, turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. So, those who are from the agricultural background, they understand what this means. See, after the summer fruit, the tree is not going to bear any fruit anymore. It's over. That's the last fruit. So in summer that you get, I mean, you have to wait for one more cycle to, for it to come back. Summer has ended and harvest is past and we are not yet saved. We are talking about summer fruits. Also, Revelation. Revelation chapter... Um, Fourteen, uh, chapter 14 look at verse 15 Revelation 14 and 15 then another angel came out of the temple called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe see harvesting is always when the fruit is ripe what does it mean? Harvesting is a sign of judgment. So what is God saying here? The fruit is ripe, now I'm going to judge. While we study about harvesting, judgment, let's also talk about ripening. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. This is what God is talking to uh, Abraham and this is what he says in verse 16. Chapter 15 and verse 16. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. What does it mean? God is going to give the land of Canaan to his children, that is Israelites. Also, to take one step back, Israelites never asked for the land of Canaan. They never asked for the land flowing with milk and honey. Go through the whole Bible, you'll never find it. It is God who said, I will give it to you. Their request was, help us out of this slavery. God said, I'll give you a bonus. Not only I will help you out of this slavery, I will take you to the land flowing with milk and honey. So, when they were coming to the land of flowing with milk and honey, there were already people there. And God said to Abraham, after four generations, you will come back to the same place. Why after four generations? Amorites started committing sins. As they were committing sins, God said their, their sin is not ripened yet. So I will let them continue. But when their sin is ripe, then I will come and remove these people. That's when I will displace them and give you that land. So what is ripening? So before the ripening or before the harvest, it means it's a long rope. See, when people give a long rope, uh, insensible people think it is... good chance to take advantage of living the same life. You know, I was telling somebody someday, in US, you take a turnpike, you'll have to get off the <coughs> toll somewhere. Yes or no? Even if you miss a toll anywhere, the law will come and catch you. You take a turnpike, you have to get off the toll somewhere. That's how it is. 
you get a long rope from God, you cannot be playing fool with Him every time. So this is what is God saying. So Amos, what do you see? Lord, I see a basket full of ripe fruit. What does it mean? It's time for me to judge the people. So when God judges, He also is very, very righteous God. So He will also tell you why I'm punishing you. He will also tell you why He's judging you. He won't say, no, I can do whatever I want. Of course, He can say that. But He's a loving God at the same time, He's a righteous God. He'll tell you why He's doing that. So let's see why He's doing that. Look at verse 3. In that day, declares the Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere silence. See, the language that God uses sometimes is very harsh. Can you, can you imagine somebody saying, hey, silence. It's kind of a tough language. And God is using that language. He says, you know what, your singing will becoming, become what? Wailing. And bodies will be flying in the air. Really? And who's he talking to? He's talking to his own children. Why would God do such things to his own children? Many people have that question. Why would a loving God do that? You know, he's a loving God. At the same time, he's a righteous God. He said, you mess with my laws, I wouldn't keep quiet. So, he says, verse 4. Hear this you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land. So, here is one reason. Why, what do you do? You are exploiting the poor people. You know, I'll tell you one thing. Anybody who is lesser than you, you should never exploit them. I know a preacher who says, you know, a pastor must live a life lesser than the standards of the congregation. Do you see that? These days? No? These days the trend is, especially in India, you see, there are preachers, they are bodyguards. To be able to at least come to him, there are ten different layers. Yeah? You can't go and shake hand. You can't go and say, today is my birthday, would you pray for me? No way. You are a celebrity status. You are a very unapproachable person. You know, God says, you need to be with the people. But here you are trying to exploit the people. You never exploit the people. And see, there is rich people what they are doing. And maybe uh, there are many Christians who also do that. Look at this next verse, verse 5, saying, When will the new moon be over, and that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market wheat? So what is their attitude? Why are you coming to church? I am coming to the church because my Lord died for me. He saved me, and I want to worship Him along with God's children. That should be the attitude. There are a lot of people come to church with different motives. One of the groups of people who come to the church is, see, I have to put an attendance in my mind that I went to church. You get it? And even if I go for five minutes, that's okay. Because anybody asks, I can say, yeah, I went to church. Yes, I went to church. These people, they went to church. They went to the synagogue. They are having their celebrations. New moons are when they have the celebrations. God gave them seven festivals. You know? Le Leviticus chapter 23, seven festivals. So what do you do in these seven festivals? The new moon day, Sabbath day, what are you supposed to do? No work. No work, just relax. I, I, want, to, I want to explain something. Usually we forget this part. You know why God said you need to take rest, you Israelites? Of course, God took rest and He told the Israelites you must take rest. Can somebody tell me why do you think God told them that you must take rest? Yeah? Why did he make it a principle for them that you must take rest? Anybody has an answer? So that they can rejuvenate and also praise and worship why? the creation why rejuvenate? of God. Why, why rejuvenate? God rested on the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day, yes. Our bodies need to rest. That's how we are resting. 430 praise. years they were slaves. They never had rest. God was reminding them, hey you fellows, 430 years you were slaves in Egypt. You never had rest. Take rest, man. Come, come to my presence. Be with me. That's what God's telling them. But what is their attitude? Their mind is on doing their business. When will this Sabbath be over? 
When will this new moon be over? Why? So you are there in the church, but your heart is not in worship. Happen some happen in your life? Yeah? Mind is reeling somewhere. The mind is thinking about something else. Your heart is not here. See, the teachers used to say that. Physically present, mentally absent. But I tell you, spiritually absent. Your mind is on all the other things in the world. No matter what be the situation, when you come into the house of God, we need to make this practice. You need to make this practice. Whether it is a good time that you have or a bad time that you have, what good week or a bad week, whatever. Lord, when I come into your presence, and what did we learn on Sunday? Right? In your presence is what? Fullness of? Joy. Joy. Really? But our mind is about when will the service be over? Yeah, why is the preacher taking so long? I need to go. Right? I need to go. I, I've got business to do. I've got things to do. Hold on. There's a launch day. You go to Pastor Chris Ange's church in Nigeria. They meet from 9 to 4. They meet from 9 to 4. And you see the, at the end of the meeting at 4 o'clock, you see the faces. Lively, joyous. It's not like, you know, preacher, you took so long, man. You know, who will be complaining that? Because they have some other agenda. Right? When you come to the house of God, don't come with any agenda. There's only one thing. Lord, I want to worship you. Do we come like that? Our mind will be on Facebook. Yeah? Talking to somebody. Or, you know, mind is somewhere else. See these people? They are in the church. But what is their mind? When will this be? Over. So, Pastor may count your attendance. There are people in the church may count your attendance. But what is God seeing? Where is your heart on when you come together for worship? That's what God is doing. See, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and that the Sabbath be ended that we may end market wheat? Skimping the measure, boosting the price. See, skimping the measure. What is skimping the measure? Yeah, you take, you knock off a few ounces from the pounds. You cheat. You take more price and then give less quantity. You don't do that. It means you are cheating people. And then what? Boosting the price and cheating with dishonest scales. Dishonest scales. Buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Selling even the sweepings with the wheat. See, see when, all, when, when this is what all you are doing, do you think there won't be a basket full of uh, ripe fruit? Definitely. What you're doing is definitely not right. So why would God not say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to come with my judgment. Right? See, you need to know one thing. When you give up, uh, there, there's one verse I want to show you. Uh, Exodus. About how we deal with uh, poor people. Uh, chapter 22 and verse 26. Exodus chapter 22 and verse 26. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return to it to him by sunset. Let me explain to you. Somebody needed some money, so you gave him ten dollars. So he said, "When will you give me ten dollars?" Said, "I don't. I'll give it to you back." Okay. So uh, give your bed sheet. You know, give your comforter here. Keep it here. Take this ten rupees. Ten dollars. After you're done, bring it back and then you can take it. Right? Or, sir, I will do this later. So, so how do you, what do you do? Like mortgage, you know. You keep his uh, blanket as a, um, uh, as a, you know, pledge. Okay? God says, return it to him by sunset. Why? 27. Because... His cloak is the only covering he has for his body. He's a poor man. That's the only one that he has got. And what else will he sleep in? When he cries out to me, I will hear, for I am a compassionate God. So when the poor has only one bedsheet, and what did you do with that bedsheet? 
you took that bed sheet and kept with you and that fellow was shivering in the cold at night and he was crying out and say god i'm so I'm, I'm so feeling so cold god says i'll hear that man and you fellow rich man you took that so what do you do you better return it by sunset why i don't want that man to suffer i tell you one thing god has always been a god of compassion towards the poor people his you know his biggest problem was all the rich guys because rich guys think you know they, i can manipulate that's why in the uh, beatitudes he begins with saying what blessed are the poor in spirit he begins there why what is the meaning of blessed or poor in spirit i am poor in money so if i'm poor in money what would i do i'll panhandle right i'll just put my hands out and say would you give me please god says that's what you need to be in the spiritual things lord i need your spirit Lord, I need your spirit. Lord, I need your spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But here, the rich people are exploiting the poor. And therefore, God says, I will definitely punish. Amos chapter 8 and verse 7. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Did you hear that? He said, I will never forget they have done. I will never forget that. So there are things that God says I will never forget. You know, it's a, it's a big study and it's kind of, uh, we need to be very careful while studying what God remembers and what God forgets. You hear me? There are certain things God remembers and there are certain things God forgets. What? He will remember our sin and he will also forget our sin. How? He says, you know, I will have put your sins behind my back. He also says, I have kept you away from your sin as far as east is from the west. He says, I have hurled your sins into the depths of the ocean. He also says, I, I uh, don't even remember that you committed a sin. But when it comes to Israel, he says, Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool on their hearts. He says, I will remember what you do. What does it mean? As long as we don't confess that sin, God will always remember that. You get it? You know, simple put it this way. What is an un... Uh, um, you know, what is a, 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 a sin that God cannot forgive? What is, a, what is a sin that God cannot forgive? The sin that you don't confess. There is no sin that is bigger than the cross. You hear me? We come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'll tell you one thing. There have been some very drastic, there was one discussion. There was one discussion um, in some, some group somewhere. He said, do you think if these guys, you know, guys like, you know, I'm making a very big statement. I know that. But this is righteousness of God. In the last moments of life, if these guys who really destroyed humanity in a big way, if they had gone and said, Lord, please forgive my sins. Right? Do you think they'd, they'd be in heaven? Yeah. How do you know? The thief on the cross. He said, remember me in your kingdom. What did Jesus say? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Problem solved. Even in the last moments, if you have totally, you know, people who have destroyed humanity, people who have killed millions and millions of people, even in the last moments, if they genuinely come and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. There is no sin which is bigger than the cross. But if an unconfessed sin is there in the life, that will create a problem. So therefore, here it says, I will never forget anything. The first part says, The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. In King James Version, it says, The excellency of Jacob. First of all, is a believer supposed to take an oath? I want to show you two verses, okay? Numbers, chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30. I want you to uh, understand. Should we take promise? When you, you understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah? During childhood, how many of you said mother dead promise? You know, mother promise, dad promise. Yeah? Said that? So, you want that guy to tell the truth. What do you say? Yeah? Mother dead promise. What does it mean? If you tell a lie, your mother will die. So, that is the meaning of behind the mother dead promise. So, should a believer be taking oath? Look at Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2. 
when a man takes oath uh, when a man takes a vow to the lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge he must not break his word but must do everything he said okay that's one part leave it like that come to matthew chapter 5 and verse 33 matthew chapter 5 and verse 33 onwards now we're coming back to what jesus was teaching on the mountain right Matthew 5.33 Again you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. Right? That's what we read just now. Number chapter 30. Look at what Jesus is telling. You know, Jesus has always been a game changer. Right? Look at 34. But I tell you, see, the whole of Sermon on the Mount is, You have heard it, but I tell you. You have heard it like this, but I tell you. What does it mean? I am changing the dynamics. Look at verse 34. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. Mm. And what he means is permanently. You know, he's not talking about going and buying and putting color. You know, people. The other day I was, uh, I was there for... Uh, uh, Alice's graduation. There was a girl with green hair. There's a girl with green hair. Is it really man? So what he's saying is you cannot turn your hair white or black. Did you ever think about that? Yeah? When, you, when your hair starts turning gray, it's very, very embarrassing. Yeah? I've seen my dad. He'll be standing before the mirror and just trying to pluck. More he plucks, you know, later, one uh, month later, some more crop up. So what people do is they apply color. So is it permanent? No. Two washes, it's gone. Again, you have to buy the color again. God says, hey, you know what? You can't even change the color of your hair. If it was white, you can't make it black. If it is black, you can't even make it white, man. You think that? He says, that's what God says. So, therefore, what should you do? Don't take an oath. So how should you be? Verse 37. Simply let your yes be yes. And your no, no, anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I want you to underline this. When you say, Lord, I will do this and you don't do it, it is coming from the evil one. Can you think about the seriousness of this? How many times when the pastor tells us or the church tells us or we volunteer and say, I will do this and we don't do it. Right? We volunteer and mostly in our church it's all volunteering right I usually I don't push it on people and say you do this right so when I say I will do this and you don't do it you know what the Bible says that is coming from the evil one very serious allegation it's not like you know you know I didn't have time you know you need to understand my situation you need to understand my job hold on what does the Bible say? You said yes, it has to be yes. If it is a no, it has to be a no. Don't make yes a no or no yes. If you do that, it comes from the evil one. That's why when, you know, there are certain, certain things that as we grow spiritually in life, you know, uh, grow as time passes by, we, we all mature. That's why when I, when I give time to somebody, it might be a simple meeting, it might be a small meeting, it might be... Um, I would want to come and respect that. You know, these days, you know, 24 hours is not enough for me. I'm doing my... I'm, I'm almost finishing my schoolwork. You know, you have to think for the whole day and may be able to write only two pages. Can you imagine? 24 hours and you, you, I mean, you write your own original ideas. You think about this the whole day and then you can write only two pages. I was sitting in another church and then I was doing my school work there. I was thinking like, I just read two pages and I had to sit down and think about it. People have work. Everybody has work. But when you give time, when you, when you say, I will come, you better keep it. Oh, is it a, oh it's, a, it's an American tradition, isn't it? It's American tradition. Oh, Indians, we can do anything we want. We can come anytime we want. When you go to heaven, 
God will not judge you based on Indian tradition or American tradition. I'm telling you this. God will judge based on His word. It doesn't matter where you were born, where you were growing up. There was one, uh, the other day I was watching a video, there was one uh, parliamentarian from uh, London, you know, in England. He came to the uh, parliament and he said, you know what? Um, I was not there, I was not present here to answer your questions, madam. I will, I'm supposed to be here. I made a mistake. And just because, are you listening to me? This is a real incident. Just because I came, he's a minister. He's a minister. He was not there to answer the question in the parliament. You could have easily said, see, I had some work. I was not just running around, fooling around. I was doing some of the work. But no, that time you were supposed to be here. You were not here. So you know what that man did? He came and said, because I was not here to answer your questions. I'm a minister. I'm supposed to give you the answers. And I was not here. I'm resigning from my post. He resigned. He resigned just because he was not there at that time to answer the question of that lady in the parliament. Oh, that is British tradition. Indians, we can do anything. Come to the word of God. Let your yes be yes, no be no. You know, we should be conscientious. We should feel guilty when we say, I will come and we don't come. It's easy to give excuses. You know, it's easy to give excuses. But to keep it up is difficult. It's difficult. But that's what the Bible says. Don't take oath. So, why does God say this? See, when you are able to keep up your word, you don't even need the oath. Isn't it? You don't need a mother dead promise. You need, you need a mother dead promise that for, for the severity. You don't need that. You say, yes, I will do this. You do it. No, I will not be able to do it. Don't do it. There has to be clarity for a believer. Many a times you see, many a time you see believers. They say, I will do this. They don't do it. You know what happens? The work of the Lord is affected. The work of the Lord is affected. See, the Lord knows how to do things around. Even if you don't worship. You know what the Bible says? If you don't worship, God can raise these stones to worship. Okay, if you don't worship, do you think he's, he's lacking worship there? Think about this. If we humans don't worship here, here, here on this earth, what is happening up in the heavens? All the angels are worshipping him. It's not that, you know, you know uh, uh, only if you worship me, then I will have my existence as God. No. He's already being worshipped there. But God says, he seeks the humans to worship him. John chapter 4 verse 23 and 24. He seeks such people who will worship him is what it says. He has the worship in heaven. So therefore when we commit to some task, we need to keep it up. There are places I've been to. There was one, uh, one, one prayer meeting. The meeting was supposed to start at 10.30. And it's my practice if I have bigger work, like playing music and all that, I'll go one hour early. I want to set up everything, I want to be relaxed, I want to know the uh, 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 people there, I want to just sit down and relax. I went one hour ahead of time, set up everything. The meeting started at 1.30, 1.30. What happened? I kept my word. I kept my word. I said I'll be there by 9.30, I was there. There was another prayer meeting somewhere. I asked those people, what time is the meeting? They were very, very clear and said, 5.30 in the evening. I was there at 4.30. I said, I'll be there by that time. And they opened the door and said, I expected that would be you. The meeting started at 7.30. I was just doing nothing, just sitting there. Every step that they were taking, every phone call they were receiving, everything that they were doing, I mean, they feel, you know, why did we waste his time? You know what? We need to be the people who will keep up our word. You know the Bible, look at Psalm chapter 15. Psalms chapter 15 and verse 4. Who despises a wild man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts. 
Yeah? He keeps his oath even when it hurts. We try to do things when it is convenient for us. See, doing things out of convenience is different, but doing things even when it hurts is different. So we need to keep up the word. Come back to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. So what is the Lord saying? Verse 8. Will not the land tremble for this? And all who live in it mourn? The whole land will rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. A lot of people say this is uh, indicating an earthquake. Right? It will just come, rise and then sink. Look at verse 9. In that day the sovereign Lord says, I will make the sun go down. See, in that day. You see, in that day. What does it remind you? Joel writes what? The Lord's day. In that day. In Joel it is always capital D. So it's talking about the time from where the rapture happens all the way to the millennial kingdom. That is the Lord's day. In that day, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious feasts into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. So God says, you know what? Because of all the mischief that you've been playing, I'm going to punish you like this. I'm going to take away the joy out of your life. All the singing will be gone. You'll be just crying and wailing. How? As if you had only one son and that son is dead. Can you imagine that? Right? Some of us have two children. Think about some people who have their only child. You know, usually the tendency is what? The only child you want to shower more love. What if God takes away that child? Yeah, pastor, don't say like that. Okay, Bible says that, not my word. I'm not saying that. He says, you will, I will make that time like mourning for an only son. Only son. You have an only one son. And you get the news. The child is gone. You can't, you can't, you can't, uh, uh, you know, uh, give solace to the parents. Only child is gone. Right? The parents will start saying, why do I live now? For who should I live now, right? That's what God is saying. Why? Because I know what you think about me. I know how you exploited. How you didn't care for my presence. You just took me for granted. Your child will be gone. That's what the word of God says. Look at what's happening. Not only that. The worst thing. You need to understand the spiritual part. The worst thing is, verse 11. The days are coming, says the Lord declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of, war, of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord, men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. What is he talking about? See, this is talking about these days, the end days, because we're talking in that day, right? In the end days, there will be lack of the word of God. You may say, excuse me, that's not going to happen. You see, there is more print media these days than before. When Gutenberg had his first printing press, that was the first Bible printed. Now look at that. Open any app, there is a Bible. Go to Apple Store, uh, you know, uh, Play Store. There are so many uh, you know, uh, apps. There is online, there is print media, there is digital media. Yeah, the U version app that you find, you know who do, who uh, who does that? You know who does that? Do you have an idea? U version app. U version app is actually done by LifeChurch.tv. That is uh, a church um, uh, which has made its presence way 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 a lot in the south. And the pastor is called Craig Rochelle. Craig Rochelle. You know they are the ones who own that app, but you know who supplies the uh, uh, the, the words you know Hobby Lobby owner Hobby Lobby owner David Green his son his son goes to different countries and they're the ones they're, by the way they are the uh, owners of the Bible Museum in DC that we went Hobby Lobby owners are so their son goes to different countries picks up the uh, biblical script and digitizes and gives it to those people and these people put it up through lifechurch.tv so, so how many updates did you get for translations? Right? Uh, updates for how many translations? 
now there, there is even telugu there is hindi there is a i tell you there is one uh, somebody uh, was telling me um, you know hawaiian in hawaiian language there is so there's so many translations so how do you think what moses uh, what amos is saying is going to happen in the last days what's going to happen there will be a famine of the hearing of word excuse me how is it possible that's wrong that's true i'll tell you one beautiful uh, point there's a there's a phrase that says water water everywhere not a drop to drink that's from a poem written by samuel take coleridge called the rhyme of the ancient mariner it's like you are in the sea what do you find everywhere it is water isn't it you are surrounded by water can you drink that sea water no that's how it is there is print media there is digital media there is apps everywhere gideons are still printing you know in every whole uh, hotel there is a bible people are just uh, distributing bibles like crazy in burma there is printing there is nepal there is printing going on in, in communist countries the bibles are uh, now uh, flowing what do you mean people will hold on hold on there are two words that you need to understand for the word of god the first one is called the logos right logos the second word is called rema rema r h e m a logos is the print media see in my bible i like some of you uh, what you do is you color right you highlight so in my bible with all the 27 years of 28 years of my study you know uh, i have color coded this this is my own color code so when i when i color it it's a code that's that's how i created this study bible in the last 28 years so am i painting god now am i doing face painting to god no i'm not doing face painting to god this is logos this is a print work but what touches you what changes you is the rema when god speaks through the same words and it touches your heart and that is where our lives are changed that is called the rema you know what there will be so simply put it like this there will be lot of logos but there will be very less of rema you get it you go to any church these days take a survey how many people are giving the gospel as it is there's one guy who started gospel of you know grace oh yeah you can do whatever you want god is a gracious god you go to singapore there's an guy who says gospel of grace you go to some parts of this country they say and how many people come to their churches oh my goodness 70000 80000 a sunday there are three services but the people who preach the word of god as it is you'll you not find much people there what does god want is he building church members or is he building is he building the body of christ is building the body of christ we don't care for church members see you your your name may be in the membership role of a church but if you are not being built and you are not in the body of christ when the rapture happens you'll be left behind think about it you know who will be caught up on the rapture day it could be any time it could be any time you know who will be caught up there might be people who are coming to church regularly doing things very very actively in the church but probably if you're not in the body of christ if you're not a born again child of god and you will be behind you will know who the antichrist is you'll come under his rule for 7 years you'll have a mark you'll have to go through persecution terrible times what about the church they don't see all this why why god's going to take them away from this world he will not let the antichrist rule his church it's my bride i'm going to take you away to myself who is that born again children okay if you're not born again what happens you'll be left behind that day the filtering happens today it doesn't happen today i'm a member in the church i can do whatever i want you know all right okay when the rapture happens the real group will show up the real filtering happens so therefore this is what the lord says there's a lot of word everywhere the print media digital media but what is not there the rema word is not there the word that changes or transforms is not there there are several in uh, in bible society 
once you know the Bibles were burnt the whole stack of Bibles were burnt there are a lot of people who have taken the Bibles and tore them to pieces you heard about them right right but what did what changed their life is it the pages that they tore no is the word of God what did Jesus say heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall never pass away what does it mean what what is he talking about is talking about this word but the word that changes the lives of people how do we know that when see the same word which is being spoken when the Holy Spirit God uh, teaches us it touches our life so I need to change in this I'm wrong in this that is called Rama there are a lot of churches who only have logos they don't have the Rama that's what he's talking about that's what he's talking about water water everywhere not a drop to drink there will there'll be a famine of hearing the word of God I'll tell you one this one example I tell this very often as the right context to tell you this remind you this think about this um, put it this way you don't want a certain person to have a desire for um, say an iPhone okay you don't want that person to have a desire for iPhone yeah look at her she's so smiling mm -hmm. yeah you don't want somebody to have a desire for an iPhone how do you do that if you buy it you have to fulfill the desire if you don't buy it do you have you killed the desire yeah if you don't buy it you are you have intensified it You'll do more web search of iPhones only if you take your laptop before you buy, go and look at the laptops and see what they are searching for. Yeah? So when, when my dad bought the first scooter, yeah, we remember, uh, the milk guy used to bring the milk and then he had a scooter. So this is how the talk in the whole community was. Our milk guy is coming on a scooter, what are we doing, man? So that's how that uh, you know uh, wave spread around, and then we we said, Dad, we need to buy a scooter. So we okay. You know what we would do? We'd be sitting in the balcony. You know, we'd be sitting in the balcony, all of us, me, my dad, mom, my sister, and my brother, and we're sitting there and watching every scooter going. And see that color is good, isn't it? That design is nice, isn't it? Those days, no internet, right? So you just watch those and say, Oh, this man also bought the scooter. That man also bought the scooter. So this is what, so you don't kill the desire. If you don't give it, you don't kill the desire. If you give it, you have actually fulfilled the desire. But the point is not the product. Think about it. I'm not talking about the product. I'm talking about killing the desire. Right? Killing the desire. See, if you buy it and give, you have fulfilled the desire. If you don't give it, you are intensifying the desire. The target is, how do you kill that desire? You know how do you kill the design for this uh, iPhone? Buy him a fake iPhone. Are you getting it? Or you go to Jersey City, you find that Rolex watches. <laughs> you know, they'll sell you for 200, 300 dollars. Those guys will come and say, hey, you know what? Genuine man, he'll just rub it on the ground and show you 200 dollars. Can you get a Rolex for 200? No. So you get it. Suppose you get a, that. So what is your feeling? What is your feeling? I got a Rolex. You go buy a fake iPhone to that guy and give it to him. So he thinks what? I got the iPhone. Did you really get the iPhone? No. But what did you do? You killed the desire. Satan also does that. He gives us the fake stuff and does a make-believe situation and we think what? Ah, I got it. I got it. That's what God is saying. People will have the literal script, but they won't have me talking to them. I wonder how many of you remember the prayer that I prayed in the beginning. Lord, as we study the word of God, do you hear that? If you, if you go back and then listen to the beginning, you will find this. You, I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, as we study the word of God, Help us not to forget or ignore the God of the Word. You hear that? Word of God versus what? God of the 
word. In the beginning was, right? You get the point? So, you can, see a lot of people just take this as a textbook. One of my professors, you know, when I first joined a college here in the US in 2006, there is a liberal college. He used to take it just as a textbook. As if God is not speaking through that. This is just a, some poetic book or some textbook. That, that, that's how he used to treat. I was so shocked and said, this is not why I came to this country all the way. And that lady would call, you know, Mahat, uh, sorry, what's his name? Uh, Mahatma Gandhi. My professor would call Mahatma Gandhi a prophet. He said, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, excuse me, ma'am. He's a great leader, but don't call him a prophet. How do you define a prophet? Go to, uh, you know, the word of God and see the uh, definitions of a prophet. I started learning all this. And this is, I said, this is not the reason I came all the way from India. I said, no way. There are people who take this as a literal textbook. This is the word of God. It changes lives. You know what changes lives? The Rema changes lives. So that's what God is saying. That will lack in the last days. There will be a lot of text, a lot of digital media, a lot of print, but I won't be talking to you. So put it the other way. This is also, in a sense, a judgment. What is ju judgment? What is a judgment? Think about it. You have the Bible, but God is not speaking to you. What does it mean? is silence. Right? How many of you enjoy silent treatment? Yeah? Silent treatment is dangerous, isn't it? Very, very dangerous. God says, I don't want to talk to you. Lord, I need help in this making a decision. Mm, I'm not going to talk to you. There are many times, how many of us have had that hunger and say, Lord, you haven't spoken to me for such a long time, Lord. Would you kindly speak to me? There is script, but there is no illuminated word. Look at verse 13. In that day, again you come to that phrase. In that day, the lovely young women and the strong young men will faint because of thirst. What is this thirst? Word of God. Yeah? Have you found such people? They are hungry for the word of God. You know who these people are usually? The people who are born again. The people who are newly born again, you know, they're like a sponge. You teach them the word of God, they'll just be soaking and soaking and soaking. The problem is with people who have got used to the church and they think, yeah, I have, I mean, uh, we keep hearing the messages, man. We can go to internet and listen to that. Go to YouTube and listen to that. Oh, so our church is always full of messages. You know. This is my philosophy of ministry. Think about this. There is a table and on the table, there is food and the food will be there always and you are growing weak you get the context <clears throat> there is food on the table and you are growing weak so what's the problem the problem is what with you you're not eating that. suppose I don't put the food on the table and you're growing weak then you can turn to me and say you know what you're not feeding us you're not feeding us but I tell you, by the grace of God, as long as I'm alive, I will always be preaching the word of God. As it is. The food will be there on the table always. Always. You pick it up, eat it, grow strong. If you don't, you can come back and say, you know, I'm not getting enough uh, word in this church. You will never have that complaint. You get the point? You know what a wonderful thing it is? There are people who are hungry for the word of God. Have you had that hunger? Have you had that hunger? I'll tell you one example. There was a girl who was dead. There was, she was dead. And Jesus came to this house. You remember that story? A woman with the uh, bleeding problem. Right? And she touched the garment of Jesus. And what happened? She got healed. You know what is the context? Actually, he was going to another family's house. You get it? He was going to somebody else's house. As he was going to somebody else's house, this lady, who was not in the plan, you know, she got healed. And he went to that house, and this girl was dead, and the father said, don't worry about it, she is dead. She was not well, okay? She was not well, and by the time Jesus came, she was dead. He said, no, 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 she is sleeping. He said, excuse me, sir, she is dead. We just now confirmed it. 
said, no, no, she's sleeping, she'll wake up. So Jesus took her by the hand and said, Talita Kumi. She said, daughter, wake up. She woke up. You know what was the first thing he said? Feed her. Right? Feed her. What does it mean? A person who is dead comes back to life. You know, the first thing that, that a person has a need is hunger. A person who is spiritually dead, who is born again, now as a child of God, you know what is the hunger you got? Read the word of God. Read the word of God. Read the word of God. When we were born again, that's what we were looking for. But as we, the Christian life continued, this started catching dust. This came into our life only when we had problems. When we don't give value to this. You know, remember in Hosea, that verse? Chapter 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also rejected, reject you as my priest. And because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. You ignore the law of God, I will ignore your children. So therefore, do you understand, dear brothers and sisters, how important the word of God is? You may say, Pastor, that's an old-fashioned thing. Uh, I don't think so. You call it old-fashioned, I call it eternal. Right, you get the point? It's different. You call it old-fashioned, this is eternal. The Bible says, whatever promises God has made in the past, they have all come to pass and not one of them has failed. Joshua says this, not one of them has failed in the past. How is it possible? And what he says, is going to happen. Somebody gave a date for the uh, coming of Jesus Christ again. Every year this happens. Some fellow will crop up somewhere. Yeah, June 28th, uh, June 24th, 2018. He gave a date. Yeah, don't believe such idiots. The Bible says what? Even I don't know when I'm coming. See, Jesus said, even I don't know when I'm coming. When my father says go, then I'll go. And these fellows are super brainiacs. They give a date. Yeah? They give a date for the rapture, for the second coming. October 28, 2000, uh, sorry, October 20, 1998, I remember. You know, in South Korea, one fellow gave a date. And all these people went to the church. You know, it's so stupid. You know, even if you are at home, you'll be raptured, man. So it doesn't mean that you'll go to church, only there from there you'll go. So, what happened? All the people sold all their property. Next day morning, the sun came up. It turned out to be a fake. You see, 2008, 2012, right? This guy who had a radio show. All these are fakes. How do you know that? The word of God. This is, a, this is your uh, dictionary. This is your uh, you know, concordance. This is your basis for our life. What to believe, what not to believe. What to do, what not to do. This is the word of God. And as newborn children, you know, as soon as a baby is born, right? As soon as a baby is born, what does a baby do? What does a baby do? What happens to his thumb? Yeah? What, is, what happens to his thumb as soon as a baby is born? It goes where? Into the mouth. Who told that child? Who told that child? Yeah? Mom, did you tell the child, see, uh, uh, daughter, son, you know, as soon as you come out, you should take this and put it in your mouth. Does, does a mom tell this to the child? No. Where do you get it from? What is the symbol? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. So what does a mom do? Start feeding the child. So the child when he's born, the first need is what? Milk. That's food. When you're born again, See, if you, if, you, if you don't love the word of God, if you don't love the word of God, you know, it's like those people in the desert that day. You know what they call the manna that they were eating every day? I want you to look at this, numbers. You know, they came to Moses and said this <coughs> very disgusting thing. You know what they said was Numbers chapter 21 and verse 5. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? 
there is no bread, there is no water and we detest this miserable food. What are they calling the miserable food? Manna. Manna. What, uh, their breakfast, you know, it's coming from heaven every day. Every day they are getting their breakfast, free of cost. You just have to go collect it. That's it. And Omar of Manna, that's it. Every day you go collect it. And now what do they say? What do they say? Hopeless food. Hey, you got that energy in the morning only because you ate that. So we forget that this is the word of God that sustains us. What a tragedy it is. I want to ask you a question. Did this word become miserable to you? Are you eating this every day? Yeah? You may say, I'm, I, I, I have the script with me. Do you have the Rema? Not the Logos. Do you have the Rema? So that's what God is saying. Last verse and then we'll close for today. Amos chapter 8 verse 14. Those who swear by the shame of Samaria or say, As surely as your God lives, O Dan, or as surely as the God of Beersheba lives, they will rise, they will fall, never to rise again. You know what God is saying? Samaria, Dan, Beersheba. You know, Dan to Beersheba. So that is from north to south. So what is God saying? You are now uh, going to be destroyed. How are you going to be destroyed? You will fall, never to rise again. You know what is the meaning here? Think about this. Think about this. The two tribe, the two nations, right? Uh, Israel and Judah. Ten tribes and two tribes. Israel went into captivity to who? Assyria. Hundred years later, Judah went into captivity to Babylon. What happened after Babylon? What happened after Babylonian captivity? I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. There were two tribes, right? Right? Israel and Judah. Israel went into captivity. Ten tribes to Assyria. Hundred years later, Judah went into captivity to Babylon. So, after the Babylonian captivity, were there two nations or one nation? Did you ever think about that? After the captivity, was there again an Israel and Judah or was there only one country? Only one country. There's only one country. You know, God in His graciousness has done amazing things that human mind cannot answer. Moses was supposed to speak to the rock. What did he do? He took a stick, the same stick, you know, with which he parted the river and all, the, the sea and everything. He took the same rod and did what? Hit the rock. What happened? Water came out. What did God say? What did God say? He lost it, man. Why did I lose it? He went into the promised land. Lord, I am the leader. I brought these fellows fighting with the Pharaoh. He disobeyed me. How many times? Just one time. Just one time. So what happened to Moses? God said to Moses, Hey Moses, I have a plan for you. What is that Lord? Go, go to that mountain. Yeah, and do what? Have a look at the city. Why? You will only look, you won't be able to enjoy. Why? Because you disobeyed. The man who brought Israel out of Egypt could not enter the promised land. Why? Because he disobeyed God. But here is the positive side of it. Think about it carefully. Moses did go to the promised land. You know that Moses went to the promised land? Yeah? Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 3. Let's read from verse 1. There, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them upon a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. 
just then there appeared before them who Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus okay where is this mountain it's in the promised land it's in Canaan so what did God do God in his grace brought Moses in a transfigured body onto that mountain with the physical body he did not go into the promised land what happened to his physical body what happened to uh, Moses physical body yeah Deuteronomy says Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 6 says he buried him in Moab when you say God buried who Moses in Moab God buried him after he buried him in Moab what happened was there was a problem the problem was Satan wanted Moses' body he wanted Moses' body so you find this in Jude verse 9 but even when the Ar my archangel Michael when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him but said the Lord rebuke you so what happened there was a dispute about the body but the Bible says the Lord buried him but if you see in Matthew 17 where did Moses come from that is the hope of a believer that's the hope of a believer transfiguration transformation when you change you know a lot of wonderful things happen that's what I mean that's not the topic now but what we understand is God told these people but the punishment is you will fall you will never rise again in chapter 9 of Amos we study how God is going to bless them how the restoration happens yeah that we shall do next week